I'm challenging myself to not read from notes. And I also find that I really appreciate seeing people's whole bodies instead of just from the neck up. So I thought I would, I would practice that as well um, in offering my remarks to you. So that's why I'm out here. And as Dr. Lyons mentioned, um, we're looking forward to a conversation with you after these remarks. Uh, Kenny and I have each written things that are very specific to being among you at the Festival of Faiths. And so if there are things that ignite your curiosity or that you don't hear us talk about, that you want to know more about, or that you just want to enter into a conversation about, um, Sarah and Halita will be opening us into conversation after their questions after we stop. So just please notice if things come alive in you in the course of this and, and hang on to them until then. Um, I thought since we're at the Festival of Faiths, I should share something with you about my own relationship to spirituality, um, which really I see as the lens through which I see the world. Um, I was raised by parents who were agnostic, although very justice-oriented. They, they took us to peace marches and civil rights marches very early in my childhood. Um, and, and so I grew up without any formal religion um, and without any specific practice. Um, and then in my 20s, I actually studied with a school for consciousness that was called Eureka. It was started by a Bolivian mystic. And it was actually a compilation of um, practices and exercises and teachings from really all the world's great spiritual traditions. And so I feel very fortunate to have had that. And it was a great discovery to me that I actually had a spiritual life. Um, but even before that, what I learned as a child was that nature was where I found the sacred. Um, it was the place that I went to, even though I grew up in New York City, I went to Central Park when I, when I sought solace and when I was confused and when I really needed to find peace. Um, and so I learned early on for myself and through my own body and my own experience that nature was a great teacher for me and a really important source of inspiration for me. Um, and then through the course of Bioneers over 25 years, I've had incredible teachers um, from all walks of life. But in particular, I've had access to a great many indigenous elders, um, again, from many different traditions. Uh, and they have become really important guideposts and learnings and teachers for me. Um, and as I've, my work has pulled me more and more into the realms of social and racial and gender justice, I've begun learning more about my Jewish ancestry and realizing that there is something for me in understanding and learning about that lineage and realizing that um, for me, I, I believe that it comes with a particular esteem for inquiry um, and, and for having a questioning mind and for really valuing learning. Uh, and, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, there seems to be some correlation between an orientation towards justice and a Jewish lineage. I think, you know, two generations back, um, my ancestors came from Eastern Europe fleeing persecution. And so it's not that far back in my lineage that that, that feels familiar and a part of making me who I am. So I thought I'd offer just a few observations before I sort of dive into the, the heart of my talk about the theme that we ha are gathered around, uh, sacred self, sacred earth. Because when I saw it, I felt really affirmed and excited that it was exactly the right place for us to be. Um, one, of the, one of my guideposts for many years has been something that comes from many of the world's sacred traditions, which is the principle as above, so below. And, um, and of course, we have one of our great examples of a spiritual teacher and activist leader in Mahatma Gandhi, who said, we need to be the change we seek to to affect in the world. Um, and, and what I've been discovering is, as I increasingly find myself drawn towards standing on behalf of justice, that part of the work of cultivating sacred self, sacred earth, is about removing the blinders that come with privilege or with the advantages of sort of being 
you know, in the benefiting side of a, of a tilted room, um, of a system that, that always advantages others, advantages some and disadvantages others. And that one of the tricky things about that kind of a system that's based on that kind of hierarchical principle is that when you're on the benefiting side, it tends to get normalized. It, it often becomes invisible. And so I found, uh, as a white woman who receives the benefits of that in our culture, that I have to very consciously sort of peel away layers of acculturated learning to be able to see through the eyes of my brothers and sisters who don't have that advantage. So I find that in my self-cultivation, that's an important part of uh, sacred self, sacred earth. And, and then the other thing that I wanted to share was um, Bioneers has really gifted me with developing a whole systems lens. And a lens that looks for what is the inherent wholeness in a system. And one of the things that I learned very early on through Bioneers is that one of the major systems errors that we tend to make is thinking that we are apart from rather than a part of nature. And nature, of course, is an extraordinary teacher. Um, the product of nearly four billion years of evolution. And, and we ourselves are natural systems embedded within nature, a natural system. So the same laws and rules that govern nature actually govern us. And so as I've been learning about whole systems, um, here are a few of the principles that I just want to mention. One is that in nature, the only constant is change. And as human beings, you know, we tend not to like change very much. We tend to resist it, we tend to avoid it, we tend to deny it. And so it's part of my practice for myself of cultivating what I call full spectrum leadership to orient myself in a positive direction towards change, to recognize that there's gotta be something good in it. And we are living in a, in a time of tremendous upheaval and change. Um, where there is change on every, every level. And so cultivating our own capacity to be flexible and adapt and respond to that, I think is really essential. Um, another element of a whole system, and a, or also known as a living system, is that uh, we tend to be self-regulating and self-adaptive and flexible. Um, but that's, those are the qualities that survive. And so it makes sense to pay attention to those. Um, Another aspect of natural systems that I've learned over and over again is that, as we've heard this morning, diversity is not something to be tolerated. Diversity is more than the spice of life. Actually, I would suggest to you that diversity is the real stuff of life, the essence of life. And that what they found when they studied ecosystems that were rich in diversity versus those that were monocultures or impoverished in diversity was that those that had many, many species in them actually adapted and rebounded after traumatic change far, far better than those that were poorer in diversity. So that means that that's true of us and of our social uh, neighborhoods and communities and of our world. And, and I'll say a little more about that later, but again, I just love that inner outer uh, reflection that we are called to through the theme of this conference. And the last piece is that living systems are what scientists call holonic. And I learned this from Joanna Macy, holonic is H-O-L-O-N-I-C, and what it describes is uh, es essentially the same thing as, as above, so below. It describes fractals. It describes the quality like uh, those Russian dolls that nest one within the other. It essentially means that what's true for the part is true for the whole, and what's true for the whole is true for the part. And so we cycle back to as above, so below, and sacred self, sacred earth. So about uh, full spectrum leadership for engaged action. I was so inspired by Wendell Berry, and he's been a, a guidepost, a teacher for me for a long time through his books. And one of the big ideas that I learned from him is an essay that he wrote called Solving for Pattern. And he suggests that there are three different kinds of solutions. You know, there are solutions that actually respond to the initial problem, 
but they may make everything else in the system worse. There are others that simply don't work on the initial problem, though they may have other benefits. But what he says in this essay, in essence, is that the kind of solution we want to be scanning for always is a solution that solves for pattern. And what that means is that it not only responds to the initial problem, but has cascading benefits to the whole system. And so as I thought about full spectrum leadership for engaged action, I thought I would offer three ideas or lenses that I think solve for pattern, actually, um, within the context of sacred self, sacred earth. So the first is about a shift from an emphasis on quantifying things to qualifying relationship. And one of my earliest mentors was um, the great Austrian physicist, uh, Fritjof Capra. And Fritjof says, the shift to an eco-literate society involves a shift in focus from quantifying or counting things to mapping relationship. And that really, until we achieve that culture-wide and really shift our attention, our care, and our prioritization on relationship rather than on things, we're not going to get there. So that's the first big idea. And I'll go into each of these a little bit more. The second is this notion of the redefinition and reinvention of leadership. And I think you know one of the things that I've come to learn is that words are really important. And uh, I believe, actually, in many ways, that language helps create reality. It's one of the indigenous principles that I've learned. And so I've had a real journey with, relation, with, um, with leadership, with the word leadership. Um, in my own effort to come to peace with it and right relationship with it. And so I want to talk about that. And David Orr, another one of uh, Kentucky's great leaders and, uh, and our great environmental educators, really says what we're facing is a crisis in, uh, in leadership. What we need to do is actually spark leadership in everyone. This is a time when everyone's leadership is called for. And the third piece um, that I just want to talk about a little bit is about the power of story or narrative to change the world. And uh, <laughs> George Lakoff is a guy who many of you may have heard of. He's in the Bay Area. He calls himself a, a cognitive linguist. And he studies language and story and its impacts on people. And essentially what he says is that as human beings, we're hardwired for story. And what that means is that once our hearts have really wrapped themselves around a storyline, as we've done for thousands of years, um, no amount of facts can get us to change the story. Only a more compelling story can get us to change the story. So I would suggest to you that perhaps we're all in the business of changing the story and that that's part of our leadership that's called for now. So uh, about this relationship stuff. You know, in the first several years of Bioneers, I think I was a sponge. I was learning from so many extraordinary leaders and perspectives. And what I saw first off was that we are in a crisis of relationship. And we're in a crisis of relationship with ourselves, each other, and the natural world. And all three of those are really octaves of the same societal inheritance or disease or imbalance. Um, and, and that spans from the personal or inner to the political and most external and systemic. Um, some of that relationship damage is subtle, some of it's obvious. But the challenge that I keep giving myself is to see it all. Um, and, to, and by seeing it all, to have that inform my choice, my choices. Um, everything from the banal choices, but important, of you know, which light bulbs and which toilet paper are we going to buy to the big choices of where am I going to spend my, my wild and precious life? How am I going to focus my attention and my energy and my efforts? Um, so on the inner, you know, I challenge myself, and I have for many years now, to notice how do I perpetuate violence to myself? You know, what are some of the ways that I judge myself um, or that I make myself small? Uh, I realized several years ago, 
when I first started this practice, for example, that I got out of the bath each morning and I glanced at myself in the mirror and I had this little voice in my head that said, you're too blank. You know, either you haven't exercised enough, you're overweight, your body's this, your body's that. It was all those self-judgments that, as a woman, um, I had. And I thought, boy, that sucks. I don't want to keep doing that, right? I mean, that's a form of self-violence. And so I made up a ritual. I, um, I created a body oil and I scented it with uh, essential oils that I love. And each morning when I get out of the bath, I spend just a minute or two anointing my body and choosing during those two minutes to pour love into my body because I need it and it's sacred. And I need it as the instrument of my purpose and as my best way to show up in leadership to what I most love in this world. So it's an example. Um, and, and, you know, then on the other side, what I began to notice was, do I appreciate my successes enough? Um, I, was, I was once in a learning circle with some young women, and, and one of them, we did this on the phone, and one of them said to me, you know, I've noticed that as women, we don't crow enough. And, and there's a very interesting article, actually, recently about self-confidence between differences between genders in the Atlantic and I would commend it to you, but um, she said, you know, we don't crow enough. And we talked about that and we realized, huh, no, actually growing up, we were taught not to talk about our successes. We were told not to be too full of ourselves, right? Well, who are you supposed to be full of if not yourself? So, so we started a practice of saying at the beginning of each call, we would say, what's happened for you in the last month that you're really proud of? Tell us about your successes and practice appreciating what we did well. Because, you know, another of my teachers is Lynn Twist, and uh, her book, The Soul of Money, is here. And she's a wonderful woman who also was co founder of Pachamama, um, doing the Awakening the Dreamer symposium tomorrow. And, um, and she says, What we appreciate appreciates. And so how do we heal the challenges of self-confidence? If we're women, whatever gender we might be in, um, how do we heal, both by stopping practicing violence against ourselves and, and also really appreciating what we do well? And externally, you know, the crisis in relationship, the evidence abounds all around us. I mean, from the divorce rate to an education system that has many kids coming out thinking they're not smart um, or not equipped for life. Um, you know, to violence against women. I, I just heard on the news that one in five young women in college is being raped during the course of her college experience right now, which is just devastating. Um, so the crisis in relationship abounds, and I would add that we're all complicit and we all suffer from it. Um, I, I actually believe the more I've studied gender justice, that our patriarchal system has damaged all of us at least equally. And perhaps it's damaged men even more than women. Um, and, and that the opportunity now is to really look at it and heal from it because the earth requires us to bring our best selves to this time. And, uh, and I don't think we have time to dwell in the wounds. So uh, in every sector, this was one of my great revelations on my own path. I began to learn, I came into this work about gender rather late in my life, and I began to understand that there is a legacy of gender imbalance that goes back hundreds of years. And that, um, and that at one time in Europe, uh, women actually had more wealth, and women were the predominant healers, and women practiced a lot of the agriculture and the resource management, and that then, during a period called the Burning Times, um, which was a three to 500 year period in European history, a great many women were tortured and persecuted and killed for the supposed crime of being witches. And, and there was a huge uh, shift in all of those systems. You know, the land use went from commons, from having commons where the whole community shared the use of the land to something called the enclosure system. The economics flipped um, so that where women had owned more wealth before the burning times, they owned less after the burning times. And medicine, of course, you had to go to 
medical school to practice medicine, and only men were allowed to practice medicine. So the system of medicine shifted as well. And I believe we all carry um, some scar tissue and some memory somewhere inside of us of that time. Around our house, we started calling it the hidden holocaust of women. Because when I learned about it, I said, how can it be that we're not being taught about this in school? That every kid doesn't learn about this. This is a huge event in our collective human history. Why isn't it being taught? So, um, hmm. so what I learned from the burning times was that not only did all those systems shift, but that actually I believe that we have assigned certain of our human qualities and values to the masculine and the feminine. And as a result of that, we carry very insidious biases that say some are better, some are worse. Some are more valuable, some are less valuable. Um, so if we're going to cultivate ourselves as full spectrum leaders, to meet this moment that the earth is asking of us, how can we cultivate our fullest capacity on a range of human qualities that ranges from masculine to feminine so that regardless of what body we may happen to be in, we can respond in the moment from a full range of human possibilities. That's my goal, and I, I certainly believe that full spectrum means regardless of our temporary gender assignment, we all have masculine and feminine within us. And how do we cultivate a loving and complementary relationship between those two? Thank you. So, and lastly, about this relationship thing, um, I, I may be being a little redundant here, but diversity, understanding diversity as an advantage. Um, again, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to understand that our cultural norm is separation. It's what we're trained for. It's what we're, uh, what we're seeing throughout our society and our culture. We're separated by generation. We're separated by ethnicity. We're separated by discipline, and in fact, we need the power and authority that we can aggregate by coming together across difference. And so really understanding diversity as an advantage both within ourselves and among each other is to me a really essential principle of how we heal this crisis of relationship. And how, how do we instead, uh, instead of accepting the cultural norm of all that divisiveness, how do we instead come to value connecting across difference as perhaps the most valuable quality that any leader can exercise? So leadership. Um, let's see, very quickly, here's my story. When I turned 40 about uh, 17 years ago, I started being acknowledged for my leadership. And I found I had very conflicting reactions to it. You know, some part of me was honored and flattered, and other parts of me were like, ooh, don't put that label on me. I don't want to be called that. It's going to make me a target, and I didn't want it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So while I'm being recognized for leadership and the world is calling for greater leadership across the boards, inwardly I have a reaction that says, I don't want this. So I, I needed to explore that. And what I did in order to do that was to enter into an exploration of all the leaders that I had met through Bioneers that had most inspired me. So I actually read uh, scores, maybe even hundreds, of leadership stories, of transcripts. And I, as I did that, I thought, OK, what is it about these people and how are they modeling leadership that's really different than what I have been taught to expect? And how can I solve for pattern? How can I look for the patterns among all these leaders that will help me understand what this new reinvention of leadership actually looks like? And what I found was, uh, <laughs> I found that the main things, uh, as Dr. Lyons mentioned, was that they were leading from the inside out. What motivated their leadership was their love. Um, it wasn't because someone had given them a title or the authority or the wealth or the resources. It was because they cared so much that they basically stepped into 
protecting, defending, and advancing what they most loved. So their motivation was really different than I had been taught to expect leaders to be. Um, they also were in a very core way. They were collaborative and relational uh, rather than singular or heroic. You know, there's a whole school now of academics talking about post-heroic leadership. And, um, and so they were collaborative. They were leading together. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, actually taught me a great mnemonic for this, which I love. She said, instead of holding it together, like we often respond to stress, you know, and clenching and getting all tight and rigid, she said, we need to learn to hold it together. And so let's hold it together. And they all were. And they also really demonstrated a very diverse array of styles and positions. What I found was that some of them lead from behind, not from the front of the room, not because they're necessarily the most eloquent or the most articulate or the most aggressive. You know, some of the leaders now are leading from within the center and from the edges and from behind. And so I think we need to cultivate leadership in all its forms and recognize that it comes in as many forms as we are people. And if our human wholeness can be seen as a living system, there are four different levels or octaves that I understand as sources of intelligence. You know, there is our, our mind, which we're very accustomed to leading from our minds. But in addition to our minds, there is our emotions. And how do we make peace with our emotions? I mean, for a long time, we've taken a lot of crap for having emotions. And there's a wonderful book that I would commend to you called The Language of Emotions um, by a woman named Carla McLaren. And really, she's an empath who went into an inquiry with each of our human emotions to understand what they're there to provide us with and how important it is to understand that anger is a way for your body to tell you that a boundary has been trespassed. And in this time, when newborn babies are born with more than 200 exogenous chemicals, chemicals not found in nature within their baby tiny bodies, if that isn't a boundary being transgressed and enough to make us all furious, I don't know what is. So there is a, a really appropriate place for anger, and I think we need to readopt it. Um, and similarly, fear, you know, fear has also been vilified. It can help make us small and avoid things. But one of my teachers is a woman named um, Diane Wilson, who is a, a shrimper from the Texas Gulf Coast, a fifth generation shrimper. And she was speaking at a Bioneers gathering one year, and she said, the way I know I'm on track is that I smell my fear, and I head straight for it. And I heard that, and I thought, what a macho load of crap. How can she say that? And then I went home, and I kept thinking about it, and I kept thinking about it, and I realized that the things that I am most fearful of talking about in public are the things that I most care about. And so, you know, I'm not advising anyone to walk into oncoming traffic or approach a dangerous animal, but, but fear can be a really useful guidepost. Um, and, and grief and despair, you know, we are in a time of so much loss to the natural world that actually, if all of us aren't finding moments somewhere in our daily lives to acknowledge the grief and loss and despair at what's dying in the world right now, we're probably not paying attention. You know, it's why I think we have a mass epidemic of, of you know, medication of people who are trying to avoid grief and despair. But what I've learned about grief and despair is that they're kind of the flip side of love, you know? And the more that I can allow myself to feel how much I care about there being elephants and whales and, and large mammals in the world in the future, I also recognize that there may not be and that I have a lot of grief about whales getting stomach cancer from plastic in the ocean. For some reason, it just pierces my heart when I read those stories. And if I can feel that grief, it strengthens me to stand on behalf of and with them. Um, Oh, I'm going to hurry through here. So, full spectrum leadership. Uh, <laughs> 
We all have different ways of processing information, right? Audio and visual and kinesthetic, and yet we have an education system that tends to focus on audio. So the kids who learn through their bodies kinesthetically come out thinking they're dumb. How do we, again, shift our world towards one that appreciates the diversity of ways we show up? Our left brain and our right, our masculine and our feminine capacities, you know, both, I think of the masculine often as discipline and focus and, and a sense of rigor, you know, holding myself accountable. And the feminine as compassion and, and nurturance and empathy. And I really want to have a balance of those things within me. So, third part, story. Hardwired for story. I found for myself, I've always loved, there's a, there's a Jewish myth, which probably there are similar myths in other faith um, lineages, that says that before each soul is born, we know what our purpose is. And that we know exactly why we're coming to earth at this time. And that then through the course of being born, we forget. And if we're lucky, and we're diligent, and we pay attention, we can find our way back to understanding that assignment. And I think that's a wonderful, exciting path for myself anyway. Um, and I would certainly invite you to explore it if it appeals to you. Um, so what I found as I've explored the detective story of trying to find my own way to my own specific purpose is that in a way, I found that I shifted from being a character in my own story who was really at the affect of everything happening around me to becoming the central character in my own story to eventually realizing I could actually be the author of my own story and that there was a level of agency and of choice that that offers me that's profound and that I wish for everybody. Um, so I want to invite you into a quick little experience that comes from a Joanna Macy exercise. Um, Joanna Macy has a, a wonderful body of work and a book that's called The Work That Reconnects. And um, she's talking about reconnecting on all levels. And one of her exercises is called Seventh Generation. So if you're comfortable and you feel like, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And imagine that you are about to be visited by a time traveler from 200 years in the future. 200 years in the future, they have perfected the capacity to send somebody back. And they're sending back a young graduate student from 200 years in the future. And that graduate student is coming to interview you. Take a moment and notice if you have any assumptions, if any feelings come up, if your body has any reactions to that. Okay, so now I want to ask you, how many of you, please raise your hand if this was true for you, how many of you assumed that that person coming to interview you might be angry or disappointed or despairing? Any of you feel that? I sure did. <laughs> well, when I did that exercise, I noticed that that was my assumption. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. Because then, of course, Joanna goes on to say, they are coming back from the future because you are in their textbooks. You're a hero in their world. They want to learn from you. What did you do when the world turned upside down? How did you know how to respond? What was your personal role, and how did you navigate a time of such tremendous systemic change? And it's a very beautiful exercise. I would encourage you to try it. Um, apparently, not so many of you are carrying that, that story as, as we're in the room at the time. What I found was that, gosh, I assumed immediately, ooh, we haven't done enough. It's going to be, this is going to be a painful interview. And they're going to be either mad or hurt or upset about what we didn't do. And so I realized how important it is that we carry a story that's about the future we are co-creating. Because really, I think the world is requiring of us all to be leaders in this time. And um, 
And the last thing I wanted to leave you with was actually a poem from Bioneers, and then a quote. The poem which my beloved partner Kenny wrote, which to me encapsulates the essence of what we're all here to talk about in Sacred Self, Sacred Earth, is it's all alive, it's all connected, it's all intelligent, it's all relatives. And a wonderful leader who will be at Bioneers this year is Cecil Williams, who is actually a reverend at Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco. And one of the things that Cecil says is, it's not enough to walk the walk and talk the talk. We've got to walk the talk. So here's to being full spectrum engaged leaders, all of us, and let's walk the talk together. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.